Well, you know, while they think about that, I'll just give you one short answer that I feel very strongly about. In fact, I'd be interested in, in Paul and, and Dr. Xi, your, your uh, reaction. Um, because I, I'm not an expert on the technology of energy, but it does seem to me from what I have learned that to make something greener, there's only one way to do it, by making it smarter. Uh, whether it's the materials um, uh, or the way the parts interface, um, uh, it's hard to make a product greener without making it smarter, whether it's a toaster or a locomotive mm -hmm. or a power generating factory or a solar panel. It seems to me that one thing our economy um, uh, depends on if we want to continue to provide good manufacturing jobs for the next generation um, is that uh, we, we can make things smarter. We, we're not, not real good at making things cheaper anymore. We're out of that business. Um, but, but we can make things smarter. So it seems to me we have an enormous interest in shifting the debate around green to, um, uh, to, to shifting the debate to green, green power, green technology, green manufacturing, which is why it leaves me utterly flabbergasted, flabbergasted to see um, uh, certain conservatives constantly fighting this when, in fact, this is the key to great manufacturing jobs in America. To the extent we change the debate to want to inject green DNA into everything, we actually play to the strength of our economy. Yeah, my comment is, uh, as I said, I mean, I always say is market-driven technology innovation. The reason there are so many startup, you know, uh, technology company, in, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, I mean, I mean, solar company, and many new solar companies. That's because they the, the, the know there's market for it. So that's why they need to focus on it. Whether or not this company, some company will be succeeded, some will not. Again, I mean, this will be, you know, by market selection. So that's how I see it. You know, I, I think I, what, what drives the markets is the government will set rules and say, here are the new standards, you have to go out and meet those. And that's what drives the innovation to come up with the the new products. I think in the environmental world, the U.S. companies are probably pretty far ahead because we have some pretty tough environmental standards here in the United States. And it's forced, at least in our industry, a lot of innovation, which allows people to then take that and export it to countries that are further down the curve in terms of imposing the same standards. We actually drive the cost down. It makes it more accessible. Um, so I think that's true. But it, I think it started to some extent by a government says, here's the rules for this country. The, the, then people in the, those countries figure out how do, we, how do we develop the new products to meet those rules. And it's a balance between how much cost you impose on the economy versus how much of an investment do you wind up getting. Because I do think there are a lot of good companies that are developing things like oxy-firing. You know, people hear a lot about IGCC and sequestration, but oxy-firing is another technology that's being developed here in mm -hmm. the United States to basically find a way to reduce greenhouse gases coming from coal-fired emission, coal-fired power plants. So, there's a lot of potential because the rest of the world is catching up to us. And I think Dr. Shu knows in China that the, the environmental, the distance between where they are today and where they need to go is pretty, pretty high. But the government's committed to uh, reducing that gap. As a matter of fact, we have coal plants in China. And every one of our coal plants, we are putting on uh, flue gas sulfurization. Uh, and that's being required by the government. So all the plants in China are putting on FGD, which is something that uh, U.S. Plants have been doing it for quite some time, but now China is imposing those same standards. U.S. companies will have a big advantage ex exporting that that technology. That's very that's uh, that's very interesting. You know, one of the points apropos of, of that question, and to pick up on what Paul just said, which country in the world has the highest gasoline taxes? It's a country called Japan. Which country in the world has the highest energy efficiency standards uh, for automobiles and appliances? It's a country called Japan. Which country in the world? as the richest car company. And as of this afternoon when I left the office, the world's biggest car company. It's a com country called Japan, and the company's called Toyota. So when people tell me we can't afford higher standards, um, uh, I tell them we can't not afford higher standards. Uh, this has been a great panel. Thank you very much, Thank Paul, you. Dr. Schuster. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to our host. Tom referenced the need to inject uh, green DNA into our government's policy. I think all of you probably 
may have seen this article in last week's uh, New York Times Magazine on the Greening of America. I invite you to take a look at, at Tom's thoughts. Before we conclude, I, I want to thank, I want to make sure I thanked everybody who helped us put this together today. I neglected to thank my old friend Daryl Blakeway, who's standing in the back. Daryl, thank you very much for your hard work on this. This is a, a one of a series of public education initiatives that will be undertaken by the Committee of 100 here in Washington. I invite you to leave us your business card on the way out to be put on our email list and look forward to other events in the future. Thank me once again for this excellent panel moderated by Tom Friedman.